good morning, everyone. Hello. God bless each and every one of you. I see there's a, a bunch of our brothers and sisters already online. And as uh, Carrie said, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, yesterday was May 2nd, 2020. It was my 72nd birthday. Yes, that's right. Yes. I've been around 72 years. That proves that there is a miraculous <laughs> God in heaven. It was a wonderful day. <laughs> it was wonderful and exciting We actually day. celebrated all weekend because Krista has her birthday the day before. Dom has his birthday. And uh, she was your, what, what, 28th birthday present? Mm, were you 28 think, when I she was born? I think it was born? 28, yeah. Something no, like that. 27. You were 27. Yeah. Krista was Dom's 27th birthday present. <laughs> and we celebrated her birthday and then Pastor Dom's on Saturday and all of it was COVID-19 quarantine birthday celebrations. Very, un un very unlike the Italian birthdays that we have. Absolutely. <laughs> Celebrating six feet apart and um, no cake and ice cream. <laughs> Amen for that. Well, we want to start off uh, this morning um, by just asking the Lord to bless you and bless your household. And it is our prayer that everybody is doing well, yes. that you are strengthened and you're strong and you're protected, as Psalm 91 so clearly uh, states. And today, um, we're going to do something a little different. Um, we put out a little blurb on, I think it was Friday, <clears throat> asking, uh, Thursday or Friday, uh, asking uh, for those who had questions about anything that is related to the times that we are in or related to the the Bible itself or what the Lord is saying right now and thinking that I would get maybe a, a question or two um, to, to, to answer wound up getting uh, inundated with questions so <laughs> we're going to pick a couple of them uh, this morning and then maybe continue on uh, answering uh, more as uh, time goes on so um, let's open up with prayer this morning. And uh, wherever you are, uh, in whatever state that you are in, um, remember, uh, the Lord is your rock and your salvation. Yes. And you will stand in the Lord and you stand on the rock. Amen. So let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege of, of coming to you, Lord, even uh, via the airwaves. Yes, Father. And we're so thankful, Lord, that um, we still have fellowship and yes. uh, communion one with another. And Lord, that your word uh, is the, the bond that links us together in your son. Yes, Jesus. So we thank ask uh, today, Father, that you give us a teachable spirit. And that you help us, Lord, to uh, explain, Lord, the mysteries of your word. Yes, Jesus. We thank you, Father. We bless you uh, this morning, Lord. And we ask that you find favor in your children today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat> so let's start this morning um, with, uh, with Joyce. And, um, I have a couple of things I wanted to talk about before we start answering the questions. Um, First of all, I want to thank so many people that have joined with us to pray mm -hmm. in the spirit for 15 minutes a day against the COVID-19, the demise of it, and also for our nation. And we're also praying for our pastors, Bonnie and Mahesh, at this season, as they are leading in, in many watches and other things that are very na national, and uh, we are supporting them. Uh, so thankful for them. Um, so, a lot of people have, have texted me or, or posted that they want to join the prayer group, and I've made like a little uh, group on Messenger with all the people on it. So, um, check your Messenger if you're part of the group, because every day people post things. It's been really good. We've been talking back and forth, and it's been very interesting uh, just to be able to communicate back and forth like that and know that we're all standing in prayer together for these specific things. Um, if you haven't joined the prayer group and you'd like to, just let me know. You can text me. You can post it on my Facebook wall, however you want. But let me know. If you just give me a thumbs up, I don't know what that means. I don't know if you're just agreeing with us or you want to join. So just say, I want to join. And then I'll put you on the, um, on the messenger list and you can check that out. And it just feels so good. We, so many people are connecting that we haven't been connected with in such a long time. It's just so good to be able to talk to all these people and, 
and share in the spirit and um, just thank you all for praying. Amen. And on top of that, some really great things have broken through this week. I'm not, it's not just because we're praying, the whole world is praying, but um, it was very encouraging um, to see on Thursday and Friday, which was uh, the last two days of April, the announcement of um, this, new, this drug that they are now, uh, the CDC is going to make uh, public for the very serious emergency situations. Um, I hope I'm saying it right, remdesivir. Am I saying it right? Very close. <laughs> and um, President Trump had the CEO of uh, the company that's making this drug and has been testing it on um, last Thursday. And they were talking about it. It was very interesting. Uh, this gentleman, very kind gentleman, CEO, is making this drug and is going to distribute it starting tomorrow to the very serious. Um, and uh, he's doing it as a donation. I think it's a 1.5 million, One million vials are going to be donated. And it's, it's really for the very serious, especially the seniors, from what I understand, that are on ventilators. They've had a very, very good um, test on that, a study done on that, it's showing a lot of improvement. President Trump said it was a step up. It's a big step up. It's not the cure of all cures, but it is the beginning of something to show uh, scientists' direction to go in. But the interesting thing that my, my wonderful niece, Donna Kosicki, pointed out to me, um, and I, I was hearing this word, and I was thinking, that word, that word, I know that word. Gilead is the name of the company that is making this drug. And uh, uh, Donna texted me with great excitement, and she said, Aunt Joyce, do you know Gilead is the name of the company? And the bomb of Gilead is what we call Jesus in the Bible. So I just thought, how interesting that is. I love when the Lord sends little messages like that to us to let us know that he's in it. He's doing it. And for that company to be named Gilead was just, to me, remarkable. And then for this gentleman, he was so kind, such a heart for the people to donate 1.5 million vials of this drug that will be distributed tomorrow. So we'll pray, be praying that the right people get this drug. And um, God is doing it. He's working behind the scenes. And we should have hope, great, great hope. And keep, just keep praying for our president. He really needs our prayers and our vice president and those that surround him. But Amen. It, we're going to be victorious. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. So thank you all for praying with us, and we'll keep praying. And this morning we're answering questions. So um, I'm going to start with a very practical question that was sent in to Pastor Dom and I. Uh, it comes about in five little segments, and I'm just going to quickly go through them. Well, the first segment was uh, the concern that because people have been quarantined for two months, will they have a weakened immune system now that they're going out into public? And the answer to that is the quarantine in and of itself, being in your house with your family or whatever, or some people even alone, is not what weakens your immune system. There are, two, there are several things that will weaken your immune system, and that is, I'll just go through them real quick, stress is the number one thing. Stress weakens your immune system. And I know we've been under a lot of stress, but we haven't been under the stress that would cause your immune system to really go down. We've been under stress, some people more than others, but your, your immune system is pretty strong. And so it's a, a stress over a longer period of time. A bad diet will weaken your immune system. Lack of exercise will weaken your immune system. Lack of sleep. And also, just um, being in a negative mindset. There, there's been, I was reading last night, there's been a lot of studies done on people who have negative thoughts all the time that dwell on the negativity. It weakens your immune system. Positive things strengthen your immune system. One of the things that they said, which I thought was very interesting, was reaching out to people during this time, even like writing cards to people, sending cards in the mail, or calling people, or texting them. That is, there's something in your 
in your system that it causes your immune system to be strengthened when you do things for other people. So I thought that was very interesting. Mm. It was an article I was reading. But in and of itself, the being in the house for six weeks or two months, however we've been, that is not going to bring your immune system down in, in any considerable way. <clears throat> the second thing was, what is our opinion on wearing masks in public? Well, first, there's two things. First of all, when you wear your mask, you are protected if somebody happens to sneeze in your face or whatever, you're protected from that, from those germs. So it, it does protect you somewhat. But also when you're wearing a mask, if you happen to be COVID-19 and you don't even know you have it, a lot of people, now they're finding out more people had it than, than, and didn't know they had it. But you might give it to somebody who's got a weakened immune system or somebody who's been sick. So it's to protect you, but it's also to protect other people who are around you. So it's our opinion for this season, it's not going to be, we're not going to walk around with masks on forever and ever, but for this season, as we're going through this time now where we're opening up all of the states slowly and we're trying to do it carefully so we don't get a backlash of this virus, it's good for us to cooperate with our leaders and they're asking us to wear the mask when we go out in public. And you know, now they're getting very fancy. <laughs> when I went out the other day, I had uh, my mask on that Karen, um, that, uh, was, uh, that had, I had made for Karina. Karina Gonzalez made me a mask and Dom. And uh, I had mine on, mine had, it happens to be bright yellow with red cherries all over it. And uh, I had so many people <laughs> complimenting me <laughs> on my mask saying how they liked it and asked me where I got it. And then, you know, we were talking, some of the girls in Publix, we were talking back and forth about how funny it is now because now it's almost becoming a fashion statement <laughs> to be wearing a mask. So, you know, make the most of it for right now. The one thing for sure, it's not going to hurt you to wear a mask. So let's try to cooperate with our leaders and try to make this the best opening up that we can so that we don't have any more of this problem. Thirdly, the question was, when will church resume in our building? And uh, Pastor Dom and I talked about that. For right now, we don't have that answer. Um, we are watching, especially this month, as we do open up here in Tennessee, and we watch over the next two weeks and see how the counts go and everything. We will be making decisions towards that, but we still are watching for right now. And we just believe it's safer to do this way and... Um, meet with you all in our home. Uh, the honest truth about Pastor Dom and I, we haven't really been anywhere since March, the middle of March. We haven't gone out except I go to the grocery store once every two weeks. And um, we go see our kids in Spring Hill. That's our big outing. <laughs> about once a week, maybe sometimes twice a week, we go out to Spring Hill and we sit in our car with some of them because some of our kids are, are exposed. Um, Josh is a, is a paramedic and he, he transfers the COVID-19 patients all the time. So, you know, we, we, he's very honorable on that and Krista wants us to keep our distance and other, some of our other um, uh, family members would rather us stay in the car just to be nice. And So that's what we do. So we're going to wait for our... our going back into our building. We will, we will definitely let you all know when that happens, though. The next one is, um, should you take your temperature before you go into work, or should you allow your temperature to be taken before you go into work? Well, there's no harm in having them put a thing up to your head, see if you have a temperature. It's not going to hurt you. It doesn't do anything to your body. It may help you, especially if somebody is coming into your workplace that has a fever. You don't want that to happen. You want people who have any kind of fever to go home and wait and see what that fever, what is causing that fever. So, and again, it's not going to go on forever. It may go on for a while, but you know some things are changing. We have to, to we have to go with the flow. So they so they say so. Taking your temperature is not going to be something that's going to 
hurt you and it probably will help you and it will definitely help the place that you work at and it definitely will help the people that work around you. So there's nothing wrong with that. Taking your temperature is fine. And let me add just a, a little caveat to this because um, there, was, there's a lot, there was a lot of questions on the, the, these particular issues uh, from the body of Christ. And I would say, um, you know, let common sense really be the rule of the day. I mean, even immunologists don't really know the efficacy of wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. They first started saying wear gloves. Now don't wear gloves. Just wash your hands. Just use your common sense. And um, we have something, that obviously, that the world does not have. We have. The power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Word of God that... Um, puts us in a type of sanctuary that is literally protective in in and of itself Amen. and that's the greatest the greatest aspect of protection that you can have so we would say you know cover yourself with the blood of Jesus inundate yourself with the word of God and just use common sense i mean yeah. i believe that nobody here is going to be taken off the earth until such time as the lord says your mission is done and you're coming home but you should still wear your seatbelt right. in your car. Right. Um, it's it's not because you're anti-faith or you're you're fearful. Um, it's just using common sense. You, know, you don't want to tempt the Lord, and you don't want to tempt the devil in exactly. those particular ways. So just use your common sense, and I think things will work out. This is one more one more question. Okay. Uh, the question was how. I have teenagers and they don't understand why they have to wash their hands all the time. And there's, here's the explanation. And you can tell this to your teenagers. They would, they would definitely understand this. These two things on your body touch more surfaces than any, any other part of your body touches. So they're going to pick up more available whatever's out there. So what do we do? We, they, Actually, in the medical field and the science field, both fields say that one of the biggest things you can do to keep from getting this virus is to wash your hands. So I would suggest setting up a little kind of um, just a, a, like a schedule of when to wash your hands. Maybe this would help your teenagers to understand instead of thinking they have to wash their hands constantly. And also, um, before I give you those little steps, um, Tell your teenagers that the way you get this virus, which is extremely contagious, is to put your hands on your face if you have germs on your hands because it has to enter your body either through your mouth, your nose, or your eyes. That's where it comes in. So if your hands have germs on them and you wipe your face or blow your nose or whatever, that's not good. You have to keep your hands clean. So here's five times you can tell your your Teenagers, even you can type it up and put it on your refrigerator. When should you wash your hands? Number one, before eating anything. Anything, even if you pick up an apple to eat, wash your hands. Number one. Number two, after you handle mail or anything that comes from outside deliveries, like from Amazon or whatever, and you're picking up boxes or whatever, after you've handled it, wash your hands. Really good. Especially your mail. Number three. Upon entering your home after being out in public, whenever you go out to public, wherever you go, doesn't matter if you go to the playground, grocery shopping, whatever, when you come home, just go in and wash your hands as soon as you get home. Number four, I hope everybody does this after using the restroom. That's number four. And number five, after shaking someone's hand or hugging them, wash your hands. That is the answers to those five questions. I hope that that helped. And um, Pastor Don, go ahead. Right. And always refer to your personal physician as well if you have uh, special cases. Uh, so make sure that uh, you're doing the right thing for you, yourself and your family. Right. Well, I get to answer a um, didactic question, <laughs> more of a, a doctrinal uh, question. It comes from my learned brother, Mr. Jim Peretic, who is in Nashville, Tennessee. And he asked the question this morning, what does it mean when a believer becomes the righteousness of God? Now, out of all the questions I was looking at, this one really hit uh, home with me because it's such a profound 
understanding that the righteousness of God is actually literally imputed to human beings. And um, we're going to start with the verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. I thought, um, we do have a screen this morning for you to along with. So this particular verse says, For he, capital H, made him, capital H, who knew no sin to be sin for us. So God made Jesus, in other words, who absolutely knew no sin at all, to become sin on our behalf. So we have a sinless person becoming totally sin for our behalf. And the reason, it says, is that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. So what does it mean when someone says that you are the righteousness of God? Well, in the letters of Paul, he uses the noun, adjective, and verb of the same root form of the word diokosune, and, um, or as some people would say dike, dike sune. And dikeosune um, is the word for righteousness in the Bible. That's a noun. The adjective is dikeos, which means to be righteous. The verb is dikeo, which is to justify or declare or to treat something as being right or righteous. Uh, so Paul uses this particular word over 100 times. Mm. And his usage reflects a particular development from the use of the word sedek in Hebrew uh, in the Old Testament. Now, so the word sedek uh, means righteousness. When we say, uh, for example, Melchizedek, um, the Hebrew word for king is mel, melki. And sedek, obviously, is the word for righteousness. So when you say Melchizedek, you're literally saying the king of righteousness. So this word was developed into the New Testament theology by the Apostle Paul. And he uses it, interestingly enough, as a forensic or a legal term. So it is a, uh, a, a, a lawful term that the Lord has chosen to assign to one of his attributes, which is the Lord is righteous, and impart or impute to us. So I want you to get this one understanding about righteousness this morning, that righteousness is imputed. And that the word imputed is a funny word. It's not something that you earned. It's not something that you can earn, but it's imputed. It's given to you. It's credited or ascribed uh, to a person or to a cause. So when you think about the word righteousness, I want you to think about it in this way. Think about how do you define righteousness? Do you think that righteousness is something that you do? Or is it something that you are? And that is the fine line difference between defining the answer of why God would ever call us the righteousness of God. That's right. Is it something that you do? Is righteousness something that you perform, is something that you adhere to, or is it something that you actually become or that is imputed to you? Righteousness does not come from us. Righteousness inherently comes from the Lord. So Philippians 3.9, I believe we have that scripture too, sheds a little bit of light on this, this uh, very... Um, theological con concept, but yet it is one of the basic fundamentals of our faith to understand why you are the righteousness of God. So let's look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. Do we have that up on the screen, Steve? Okay. It says, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness of from God on the basis of faith. So here we see a really clear definition, once again by the Apostle Paul, says the righteousness is from God, 
but it is appropriated and it is imputed to us through the basis of our faith and our understanding. So righteousness is not something you do right, but the state of right being, it's the same thing that you find with the, the whole concept of holiness. Holiness, holiness does not, is not imparted to us because we do something. Holiness is a state of being because Jesus was crucified on our behalf. It's very important to learn and understand the differences between the two. And this is a very exciting message yes. to me because what we're finding out is that righteousness in God is given to us as a free gift. And it's one of his attributes. So after Jesus, after his sacrifice on the cross, God imputes righteousness, not to those who, who strive to obey the law, like Galatians 2.16 says, but to anyone who believes in his son. So the imputation of righteousness comes from anyone or to anyone who believes in the Son of God, in Jesus. So you change, one of your attributes becomes that you are righteousness, the same righteousness of God. Now that is a profound statement, a heavy statement, because Jesus took our sins and gave us his righteousness. And um, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, the moment we believe in him, God treats us as righteous apart from, from our works or even our obedience. I know that sounds like a scary thing. But let's look at Romans chapter 4, verse 5 through 8. Romans chapter 4, verse 5 through 8. It says, But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as what? Righteousness. As righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man who God credits righteousness apart from works. And this is the quote. It says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. So ultimately... This new covenant righteousness, a righteousness comes to us, it comes to us by faith and not by work. So because of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, a sinless individual became sin and the Lord says, I have a characteristic in my being and one of my chief characteristics is righteousness. Jehovah Makadeshkum, the Lord who is righteous. And this righteousness, I am going to give it to you if you believe that my son became your sin on the cross. I'm going to give you my righteousness. Now, that's not a shade of righteousness or a partial righteousness. It is a totality of the character of God taken from him and imputed into us. Not because of what you've done, not because of what you said, or even how you feel. It's done because you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So let me put it this way. We then are not righteous because of how good or morally decent we are. We are not righteous because we exercise self-control or self-discipline. We are not righteous because we read our Bible every day. We are not righteous because we feel righteous. We have a good day. But we are the very righteousness of God in Christ solely based on the fact that the sacrifice of Jesus made us that way. So when Jesus was sacrificed at the cross, and you believed that, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. You were made into the righteousness of God. This is why God can call you the righteousness of God in Him. 
because it has nothing to do with how good we are, how bad we are, how obedient we are, how disobedient we are. We are in a state of righteousness. And God calls us that clearly in 2 Corinthians 20, uh, 5.21. So when you believe this, your faith literally is accounted to you as, as righteousness. So God wants us to use that faith to believe and decree and declare that we are the righteousness of God. God wants us to say that. He wants you to believe that you are righteous Amen. in his eyes. Even in the midst of your weaknesses and the, the, the midst of our struggles, the things that we're down, our faithless times, God wants you to use your faith to confess and yes. declare that you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Why? Because he said so. Yeah. That's, that's his business. That's right. And you cannot say that God is not powerful enough to impute righteousness to me because of the condition that I am in. It is because of the condition that we are in that he imputes the righteousness Thank the Lord. of God. Amen. So you don't need faith to know that you are sinful. Nobody needs faith to know that you're sinful. But you do need faith to declare that you are the righteousness of God. So God wants us to use your faith that you have in Jesus to make the declaration that you know that you are the righteousness of God because of what has been done for you. For example, let me give you an example. Let's say you jump down the throat of your husband or your wife, like sometimes <laughs> happens. I don't know how that happens <laughs> with two saintly people. Well, let's say, for example, you jump down the throat of your husband or your wife and you feel bad about it. But God wants you to exercise your faith to see yourself still as righteous in the midst of that failure. Even in the midst of messing up, God wants you to see that you're still righteous in the midst of all that. The revelation that you are still righteous will give you the power then, not only to love your spouse, but see things in a different light in order that you can resolve things with him or her. And I can hear your enemy um, saying, the enemy, the devil, you always hear him say, how dare you call yourself righteous when you did that, whatever it is that you did that was wrong. That's the time you need to boldly declare, I am not righteous because of what I have done or not done. I am righteous only because of the blood and the completed work and the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So going back to Jim's question, um, which was, why does it, or what does it mean when a believer becomes the righteousness of God? The importance of the passage really lies in its presenting the truth that the purpose of God in the death of Jesus was not only that men would escape punishment and escape hell, but that men would become righteous. So our salvation is not just to escape hell, but God's intent was through the death of Jesus to impute or impart something to us, a part of his attributes and his characteristics, which was his righteousness. So then... I believe, Lord, he says, now you are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. I hope that kind of clarifies a little bit of, of why you can, you can call yourself that or even make that declaration. So let's say you're in the midst of a very bad situation. You mess up. You, you, you do something wrong. You're feeling guilty about it. It is in those contexts, in that situation, that the Lord wants you to rise up and say, well, wait a minute. No matter what I do or say, I don't control the righteousness of God in me. God gave that to me as a free gift, not as a work of the law or how good I am, but based solely on the fact that Jesus finished this work on the cross, and I believe it. And when you believe it, God imputes something to you 
to establish you in the characteristic and attribute that he has called righteousness. So that you are righteous. You say, well, I'm a sinner. Well, I will tell you that when you die and go to heaven and you stand before the Lord, what he is going to see is the righteousness of God through the crucifixion of his son. Mm -hmm. And you will be accepted into heavenly domains, not on the basis of how good you did your stuff down here on this earth, but on the basis of whether or not you put your faith and belief in the person of Jesus Christ that he was crucified, buried, and resurrected from the dead. And if you believe that, the power of that imputation of righteousness will overwhelm all aspects of sin and iniquity in our lives. When, when, when we have that realization, which is, is an excellent explanation of that, when we have that realization, we will automatically, when we do something wrong, because of the wonderful gift of righteousness, That's right. will cause us to want to repent instead of run from God. Yeah. It, would, it would cause us to want to repent and run to God because we have the freedom to know that we are righteous in Him and we don't have to carry around that sin or, or whatever it is that we've done. We can go to God and, and we can for, get, for, you know, get forgiven, but we have the, um, the freedom to know that. Yeah. I, I don't know if I'm using the right word. But well, well, we not only have the freedom to know, <clears throat> we have the power to be able to repent. For that's also a gift from God that emanates from His righteousness. He grants us the power to repent. So if you're going to be in a bad situation, uh, or you mess up, let's say, and and you, and you you feel guilty about it you don't you don't know what to do god wants you to exercise at that point in time a belief in something a faith in something a trust in something that you are that you don't think you are yeah people say well i'm not righteous in that situation because i'm not doing the right thing well it's a misdefinition of the word it's not that you're doing the right thing righteousness has already been imparted imputed to you you are righteous now you if you mess up you can correct that where do you get the power by standing in the knowledge stand in the knowledge that you are the righteousness of god and no matter what happens he's not going to change that viewpoint it gives you confidence that's the confidence. word i'm trying to yep. think of. and boldness it gives yep. you confidence to say i can go to daddy and say look i messed up but he you know that he's going to help you get through this because you are in his, you are his, you have his righteousness. Amen. He sees you covered with his righteousness. Amen. And what what a freeing thought that is. Amen. To to get into your spirit and 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 to just it gives you confidence in the Lord in so many things. So let's let's end this segment, uh, this particular question uh, by Jim Peretic, uh, with the the scripture that so clearly states. Our position, 2 Corinthians 5.21, the one we started out with. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Jesus, in him. And then I hope that uh, helps your understanding and, and your confidence level in who you are in Jesus That's Christ. That's awesome. Very awesome. Amen. Do you want me to? Yeah. Okay. One more. Well, we have a couple of questions from a young Maybe lady um, that were very deep, and uh, we could go on and on about these questions. But I'm going to kind of um, I'm going to say all four questions and then kind of give an overview of it, because basically all four questions cover almost the same thing. One one question was, what is the best way to combat doubt? <clears throat> The, another question is, how do you know you're hearing from the Lord? Another question, what's the best way to strengthen your relationship with the Lord? And the last one is, what's the best way to overcome depression and fear? We could do a whole sermon on this, <laughs> which probably you will, <laughs> I'm sure. But the biggest thing about those four questions, the underlying thing about all of them, how, to how do you combat doubt? 
How do you know you're hearing from the Lord? How do you strengthen your relationship? It's the best way to overcome depression and fear. The very first thing is to read the Word of God. Mm. Read the Word of God. The Word of God, it says faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Your faith has to be built up. Your faith has to be strengthened. And the only way, really, that happens is through reading your Word. And when you read the Word of God, you get the mind, you, you understand the mind of Christ, what God is saying to you, what you mean to Him. So many things. All day long, all week long, we're getting bombarded with satanic, demonic, negative stuff that the enemy of our soul tries to make us think about ourselves and other people. And, and the Word of God is the total opposite. Total opposite. And so when you read the Word of God, and you know, sometimes you have time to read chapters during the day, sometimes you only have time to read one verse. I will tell you from experience, sometimes that one verse will get you through a whole season of something you're going through. That's happened to me several times. Mm -hmm. Just a verse that I hold on to, like what Pastor Dom talked about last week, the anchor. It gives us hope. And that's what we have to have to keep from being tossed about by depression and fear and doubt and all the other things that, that try to keep us from knowing how much God loves us. And once you start to build on that faith with the Word of God, <clears throat> that's how your relationship gets stronger with the Lord because you, you start to understand who He is and how He feels about you. And you're spending time with Him. And how do you build relationship? By spending time with people, by talking. And then... As you're talking and getting to know them more and more, <coughs> you get to know their voice and you get to hear them. When my husband calls me on the phone, I don't have to look to see who called me. When I hear his voice, I know who it is because I, I know his voice. I have a relationship with him. I spend time with him. We know the Lord's voice by spending time with him and getting to know him. Then when he speaks to us and it comes to pass, that even builds more onto knowing that you heard the voice of the Lord. And as time goes on in your life, you have all these different experiences with hearing what you think might be the Lord and then Him confirming it or confirming it in His Word. And lo and behold, all of a sudden, you're starting to build this wonderful life of strength in your faith and in your um, ability to combat depression and fear. Man, when, when you start to get depressed and fear, grab the Word of God, open it up to, to Psalms and start reading, your, your fear will go away. Amen. It will go away. And Amen. I want to end with this one thing, especially to this young lady who sent in these questions. One of the best scriptures in the whole Bible, as far as I'm concerned. First of all, Philippians, to me, that's my favorite book of the whole Bible is Philippians. But one of the very best scriptures to combat all these things that you sent in to us. is found in Philippians 4, starting in verse 6. Be anxious for some things, the bad things, no. Be anxious for nothing, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer, that's worshiping the Lord, talking to the Lord, honoring the Lord, glorifying the Lord, and supplication, which is asking when we need things and making requests. With thanksgiving, always with the thanksgiving in your heart towards God because He's got you in His hand. He's with you. He loves you. That in and of itself is to be the most thankful for just what Pastor Dom talked about today. Supplication. Um, <laughs> not supplication. Pastor Dom talked about today. Righteousness. Righteousness. That's, that's a thing to be thanks, thankful for no matter what. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, Paul, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. That scripture in and of itself, you can meditate on that for months at a time. 
that is a scripture that will bring you peace, that will take away your fears, that will take away your doubts, that will strengthen your relationship with the Lord, and finally know that you're hearing from the Lord. Be encouraged. God is with you. Amen. The Word of God is powerful, like a sharp two-edged sword that really cuts to the issues. Yes. Well, um, this morning we're going to end our, our service in communion. And I just want to say that, you know, when I was uh, picking out the questions, if you sent uh, questions, as, as many of have, have you have done, um, when I was looking over that one particular question, uh, I felt like the, the impressed of the Spirit, and the Lord saying, I want you to remind them, remind them of who they are in Christ. Yes. Remind you of who they are in Christ. And the key to that was that this is a uh, this 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 word dikeosune this righteousness of the Lord is a legal term. You were legally made Amen. righteous by the Lord. And the price that was paid for that action was of course the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ which we will share here in a moment. So legally this morning I'm going to declare you righteous, the righteousness of God Amen. in Jesus Christ. Amen. You are righteous. Whether you think you are or not, I don't think it even ma makes a difference. Uh, it only makes a difference in your faith. Yes. So you believe that you are the righteousness of God. Amen. Uh, we want to continue on uh, with our uh, communion together. So go get your elements that you have. Uh, this is a very important time to share in the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. These are the covenantal elements of understanding our place in the body of Christ and what his actual body was uh, subjected to for our salvation. And of course, the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. And um, it's interesting that the, the power that is found in the blood of Jesus Christ is enormous yes. for the shedding uh, of that blood. It created a scenario which our, our sins were obliterated. Yes. So think of a giant eraser, if you will, being the blood of Christ. That you, Whatever you've done in your history or whatever you will do in your future is literally erased by the power of of the blood of Jesus Christ. So Lord that's Jesus, very, very powerful. Of God. So let's lift up the bread, the body of Christ together this morning. Thank you, Lord. And we'll pray our prayer over this bread this morning in, in faith. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who is King of the universe, who has brought forth this bread from the earth. And Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for the fact that you were buried in the earth. In three days, Lord, you were raised from the dead to be the prototype, the first one of many of us who would follow in that exact same resurrection. So we look forward to that day, Lord, when our faith will become sight. We receive now your body, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Also now, as we share together across the airwaves in the, the sacrificial blood of Jesus, the cup of redemption, as it was at Pesach, Passover, we say, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam borei pri hagafen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, who is King of the universe, who has brought forth this fruit from the vine. And Lord, we appreciate, Lord, the fact that you volunteered yes. to shed your blood on our behalf. It wasn't that you were forced into a situation. But Lord, you looked at us, and for the joy that was set before you, you endured the cross. Yes, Lord. And Lord, we declare today that we are, we you, were and are that joy Thank you, Lord. that was set before you, Thank which you, gave Jesus. you, Lord, the motivation to do what you had to do to purchase our salvation. So Lord, this morning, we thank you for the blood. We apply it to our lives and our homes, our health, our finances, our relationships, 
our overall well-being. We apply your blood to it, Lord, and say, Blessed are you, Lord. Blessed are you. There is the power, Lord, to convert and transform our lives into the image of the Son of God. We so appreciate that, Lord. And we ask you now to bless this cup in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, Lord. Thank you. Thank Amen. You. Woo. Um, there is a button um, on the Facebook for our, our tithes and offerings. We want to definitely try to keep our building open and our school uh, running in these difficult times. So uh, please consider that in your faithfulness towards your contributions and your um, stewardship towards the Lord. We're very thankful for We're very thankful everyone for who's been contributing. Thank you so much. Amen. And also, uh, we're going to ask that if you have any other questions, that uh, this would now be a good time to start writing, which gives me a little bit more time to look over more and more of them. So any questions at all you have about the times and the days that we are in and how the Word of God applies to it, please um, jot it down and uh, I uh, Put it on the site, the uh, Facebook site that you are on as a comment, and we will um, attend to it. Amen? Next week is Mother's Day, mm -hmm. and we will have a special guest speaker or two. So tune in. I think you're going to be very blessed, and um, it'll be a, a great way to share Mother's Day in front of the <laughs> computer with your coffee and whatever, <laughs> and flowers, and be with your moms. So... God bless you guys, and want to thank Black Pearl Productions and Stephen for bringing this to you all today. Shalom, brothers and sisters. Shalom. <laughs>